Craig Berry here with the Mortgage Reports podcast, and today we're discussing the state of our current housing market and how it compares to the one we've experienced previously just before the major housing crisis that happened roughly 15 years ago. Today, joining me is Mike Hardy. Mike is a managing partner for Churchill Mortgage California and Nevada Team a top 1% in the nation $100 million origination team. Mike is also the principal and co-founder of Cyrus Opportunity Zone Fund, and we will definitely get more into Oz in just a little bit. Uh, Mike has spoken at conferences and events in front of audiences of over 30,000 people. Mike has been quoted on Fox Business News, and he's been interviewed by USA Today. Mike Hardy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Craig. It's a pleasure to be here. Look, look forward to our conversation. Thanks, Mike. I do as well. So let's just get like right into it and just kind of get some of the basic details out of the way. Mike, how did you get into the mortgage industry? So uh, in- interesting story. Like a lot of people, you, you find yourself in the mortgage business kind of by accident. I was a pre-med undergraduate and uh, realized through my junior year of college, I had zero desire to go to medical school. So I ended up picking up a business minor and just love the world of business. I ended up working as a financial advisor for about five years uh, out of the university. And so my transition into mortgage came through a buddy of mine uh, where the two of us were young guys. I'm an advisor. He's in the mortgage business. And I just suddenly got curious about what is possible in the mortgage business. How does this work? and started asking all kinds of questions and pretty quickly realized that there was a blue ocean strategy that I saw to really be an advisor for people in the world of real estate and help manage debt and show how people can build wealth over time and just all the things that are sort of beyond just the transaction that have to do with building wealth and efficient structuring of debt to help build that wealth. So it was a transition. But it started from being a financial advisor and then seeing a path that uh, I thought would be kind of a cool path to go down. You know, and and that makes sense. A lot of I don't know about you over your career, but a lot of the relationships that I have developed with folks, uh, it's there, there's just a close parallel with the the financial advisor aspect of it. So it's it makes it a very interesting industry to be in for sure, depending because, you know, you can, you can get into it. You know, some people I talk to get into it because they, they heard there's good money and that's okay. Uh, and then other people, it's because they just really like making uh, dreams come true with home ownership. And then there's the other side of it, which is what you mentioned. And it's more of a, like a financial planning and, and how to build wealth through, real estate, and so on. So there, there's a lot of different reasons to get into it, but all of them are, uh, they're kind of cool. You know, <laughs> I, I really love three different things. I, I'm a people person, so I'm fascinated by human behavior. Uh, I'm a math guy and really more conceptually. I, I mean, I, I'm, I, I, one of my favorite classes at the same time I took a, a, a trigonometry class was consumer math back in high school. And it was just like, this is common sense stuff. Like I could, I could do things with this. Um, and then real estate. And so the mortgage business has always been an amazing mix of people, of numbers and of real estate. And my, my uh, motivator was, you know, of course, to build a better life for me and my family, to see a blue ocean strategy, as I mentioned earlier. But I thought it would also give me a kind of a pulse on how to build and grow in real estate and build wealth in addition to just the debt management side, which came fairly naturally. So that's the backstory. It's been a wild journey since that time, um, as you know, maybe we can get into in this call. But uh, but yeah, I love every, yeah. I love everything about it. Well, you know, I don't know how many other people that are listening feel like trigonometry trigonometry is common sense. I think you might be blessed there. <laughs> you know, some of us are, are more gifted in math than others. You know, it's, it's interesting. And we'll get into this a little bit more, too, as far as like you and your team building. Uh, but a lot of people, when they first get into the mortgage business, they think that it's a... Um, 
it's more of a finance and math related industry. And then uh, there's a lot of people that then figure out, oh, no, this is a people business. You know, this is something that where it's more about dealing with people and having to understand how to communicate and they have to develop a whole new level of skills. Uh, so when you have a little bit of both and it sounds like you do, you know, the ability to communicate and, and, and you like people, but you also are well versed with math, it definitely makes things a little bit easier. That's that's very true. And, you know, I think that I. I like to think of it this way. There's really kind of five big life events that people have. And, you know, it's getting getting married, you know, maybe graduating from college, having having kids, starting a business, um, buying a home is really one of those big events. And I yeah. think I have to protect myself against this because we've done so many loans over the years. But we're, we're, this is a pivotal point for somebody that sets them on a trajectory of building wealth. Once you're in the game of real estate that I, I think most people don't appreciate or totally understand. I mean, just sort of the, the compounding. If you look at, if you look at the majority of millionaires that exist across this country, um, the overwhelming majority of that pool is through real estate. And then also small business owners, um, it, it seems that real estate is always a part of that equation. And so, um, but there's two separate things in my mind. So I'm also a believer that a healthy home environment is essential for unlocking, um, possibility and purpose. And, you know, just sort of when you, when you have a clear, a mind that can, look into the future and go after things you can't do that from a place of complication you have to do that from a place of clarity and i think a healthy home healthy families healthy homes in my opinion that's something that i think is part of the service in addition to the wealth building is creating safety and security and clarity that opens up and unlocks potential for for kids um, and the, the home process is part of that so all these things kind of tie together for me and I, I think without healthy homes and healthy families, um, you know, it's it's uh, we underserve what's possible for ourselves and for how we can contribute to this world. So there, there's a little bit of additional philosophy that uh, is important to me that I thought I'd share. No, I, I like that. And I agree. Uh, it's a it's a very it's a very important component to to what we do. You know, um, I totally agree with that. So I'll put you on the spot, like right off the bat and, and say that, like, if you were to go back and, and do this again and, and, you know, just start over, is there, is there anything that you would do differently? You know, I would, I, I will, I will speak to this. Um, for a long time, I was a, I read a book recently called Who Not How. I actually read it a couple times. And for a long time, I was trying to figure out the how personally for everything. And finally, something clicked a number of years ago that um, each of us as individuals have a streak of genius in us. And the, the sooner that we can spend the majority of our time and our focus in our zone of genius, it just opens up worlds of possibility. But in order to do that, we have to be aligned with healthy people that have complementary strengths. So it's a long way of answering your question, but I would, instead of, I'm kind of a recovering do-it-yourselfer in all areas of life. And so, but now, yeah. now I outsource absolutely everything possible and I, and I protect my time to think and look into the future and aggressively protect and get things off my plate that are not in a zone of genius. And so if I was to do it over again, I could, I could kind of build everything that I've built in maybe a third of the time by aligning with the right people. And, and also, uh, um, I think that would be the big, the big one as far as like, I don't know, I'm a believer that you could pick any path in life. And if it is in an area where you have genius and you have passion, um, my work for me is not work. It's like play. It's just, it's super fulfilling. So uh, I would not try to convince myself that I had to do or had to figure out things that I sucked at or that I didn't want to do. And I would just move it off my plate that much faster. Now, you know, most of the people that I talk to that are successful, 
in whether it's mortgages or, or, or real estate, have figured out that part as well. In other words, figure out the things that uh, you can essentially delegate. At what point did you figure that part out and how did you figure that part out? Because for some, it takes a lot longer than others. You know, I, you actually brought me back to the time I first I hired my first assistant many years ago, and I felt kind of bad. Um, I I made a list of all the things that I sucked at and I didn't want to do, and I wrote job description across the top, and I kind of like you know had the interview assist as financial advisor at the time, financial advisor assistant, twenty hours a week, whatever it was, and I remember having the individual come in, and I I kind of felt bad, but I slid the job description across the desk, kind of like almost cringing a little bit because it was <laughs> such horrible things that I, you know, that, that I needed someone to do. And this individual, right. Jennifer's her name, she, she looked at it and she got excited and it, it was sort of this aha moment, like, Oh, I love all this stuff. And so, you know, something switched in my mind. It took me years to actually make it habitual and behavioral, but that was my first aha moment was, the things that I am not good at, somebody else is super good at and excited to do. I totally, I totally get that, and I've been there. I think I, I, uh, uh, something that we learn as we're growing is a mistake that a lot of people make, and I, and I've made it is to bring somebody on that's a lot, uh, almost exactly like yourself, and they have a very similar skill set. But the reality is, uh, you want to bring on people who have different skill sets and they enjoy doing tasks that you don't enjoy doing because if they enjoy it, they're probably better at it. That's right. Yeah. It's a uh, complimentary skill sets. Every, every week I go through an exercise called the general's tent and that the general's tent is a process of, it actually comes from the book, the art of war by Sunza. And the mm -hmm. thinking, the thinking is to, there's about uh, 12, 15 different questions that I answer um, and that are related to both in, inflection, internal assessment and external assessment. And part of it is looking back at the week, looking forward at the next, looking at the next year, looking at the long term vision. But one of the questions on there is what is it that I need to automate, delegate or eliminate? And so every week I have a list of things that. I know I need to automate, delegate, or eliminate. And then I'll start thinking who in my, you know, life circles, business, you know, on the mortgage side, on the investment side, who is it that is better than me at this, that I can move off as fast as possible. And the thinking, this is freeing for me because if, if you're waiting, at least for me, if, if I was usually waiting for somebody to be able to do it equal or better than me, but that's never the case at first. And so what was freeing for me was if somebody can do it 80% as well as you, give it away. And at some point, especially if it's in their gift mix, they'll surpass you. But at first you have to like give permission, can they do it 80% as well? And so that was, that was the aha moment for me because I couldn't find people. And then I found the 80% and then especially if it's in a gift, it's pretty quickly they're going to do it better than me. So that was my aha moment. I love it. I love it. So let's, let's touch on this resume uh, for a minute because it's impressive, Mike. Uh, so you've helped build a $100 million mortgage team that ranks in the top 1% of the, comp uh, of the country. Like that's, that's like no joke. <laughs> so tell me how you've gone about doing this. Are there anything that – is there anything that you can share? Because, you know, there, there's a lot – obviously, you know, there's a lot of folks that are in – the, the mortgage business, but to get into the top 1%, that's quite a feat. How have you done that? Um, you know, a lot of it has to do with being super intentional in all areas of life. In fact, I was just, just talking to the team earlier this morning, and I'll, I'll share a little bit of this, but I think it's, it's highest and best practices over time uh, with consistency. And um, let, me, let me think about where to start on how to answer this question. <laughs> um, there's... There's, I think that there's only three things that we can control in life. And it is, in fact, I would share it with my youngest when I would drop him off at school. I would say, Caleb, be an ace today. And that stands for attitude. Uh, it stands for courage and it stands for effort. And so, you know, be an ace, bring your best attitude, live with courage, bring your best effort. But doing that over time, 
I think that it's a lack of consistency and a lack of focus and a lack of vision that keep talented people from being able to be excellent because of inconsistency, like a car that stops and starts and stops, stops and starts again, where if you continue in a direction, that's the right direction, that's with the right people, that is the right efforts, you start to get compounding growth that takes place over time. No different than, you know, our, our, our money system in, in real estate. So to answer the question, how to get top 1%, it's with, it's living with intentionality every day, aligning with the right people and doing the right efforts and doing it even when I don't feel like it. Like I just finished the, uh, the 75 hard program. It's actually the second time mm-hmm. I've been through it. If you're familiar with Angie Frisella. And so every single day, gallon of water, two workouts a day, reading 10 pages. I've got some more things that I do sitting in silence. Like I have this whole regimen that I do every day religiously. And guess what? Most days I don't feel like it. I don't, I have most days I don't. And, and so, uh, to me, that's part of it. It is having a direction, living with intention, taking the time to think, going through the automate, delegate, eliminate, uh, aligning with the right people, but doing it for a decade as opposed to doing some things really well for a couple of weeks and then getting focused on something else. And that was the old me, like just sort of chasing rabbits all over, you know, the park. I'd be exhausted, but I had not caught a rabbit because I was focusing (laughs) on too many things at once. So now I'll get something in my sights and get after it, build it, anchor it, bring in the right people, and then look for what else fuels me and what else is a passion and can it have a complementary kind of nutritional value with other things that I'm doing. So it's not like there's divided energies and efforts. It's like alongside. And so that's what the mortgage business is for me aligned with the real estate investing um, that I do as well. Very nice. So Mike, what do you think is more important? Uh, You touched on a few of these, but if you had to pick one uh, focus or determination focus or determination um i i think that those have to go hand in hand if i have to pick one that's more important um yeah you know because you kind of have to have both don't you they have to go you can be super focused um but not consistent and you'll make zero you'll make zero progress you can be super determined. You know, it's like chasing, what is it? It's, you have to have the right strategy as well. And Mm -hmm. you you can't run east and look for a sunset. Like it's just not gonna work. So there's gotta be, there's gotta be a combination of, you know, focus, readjustment of strategy um, and, you know, determination slash consistency that all accompany each other. Those are the things, I mean, it's like people ask, how do you, my goal is, my goal is to be top 1% in, in, in four areas of life. Okay. Just to, just to share it. It's like on the financial side, sure. mortgage side. Um, I want to be, uh, I've been married 26 years and I have four kids. So I want to be, you know, the best family man possible. Um, it's hard to quantify like what that means, but again, it's an intentionality, um, on the physical mm-hmm. side. Um, I remember hearing this. It was, if you spend 15 minutes a day on something over the course of one year, you'll be in the top 5% in the nation by doing just 15. And I think they said 18 minutes, but I have what's called the 1% rule, which is 1% of your day is 15 minutes. So yeah. how can you not do something that is going to like better your life, better your family for a minimum of 15 minutes a day, if it's truly important to you back to the consistency. So yeah, that's a, that's a little bit of a loaded question. So I don't know what's possible without having both. No, I, I agree. And, and, and I don't know that there's really a right or wrong answer when it comes to things like that, you know, because there's so many elements to success from consistency and focus and determination and, of course, attitude. And, you know, there's all these things that come into play, but everybody's got a slightly different take on them. So I'm always curious to hear somebody who's had success like you have. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of just, you know, where, where you place those. And, and, and oftentimes what I've found is uh, the people who are really successful, um, they, they, they put them on almost the same level, you know, mm-hmm. cause you, cause they're all equally important. Yeah. 
I think there's just certain so, things in life you can't compromise on if you're going to want if you're going to build something of substance. My dad used to tell me there's no shortcuts to any place worth going. And I look for shortcuts for a yeah. while. And then the shortcut is actually the <laughs> the harder way. Um, so but yeah, interesting. Good, good, question. Agree. good question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, you know, as you know, moving on the the there's a lot of people who are comparing today's housing market to the housing market that we saw in 2007. And there's a lot of opinions about that. We're going to see a repeat of a housing collapse. There's opinions uh, about mortgage rates and what they're going to do. Uh, There's a lot of opinions about uh, every time I, I open up social media, there's some people who are saying now's a great time to buy. And a lot of people who are saying uh, that would, that's the worst time to buy. You know, there's many wildly varying opinions on where we are right now compared to where we were. So let's just start with this. How would you say that today's housing market compares to the housing market that we saw in 2007 and 2008? Oh, yeah, it's categorically different. I've, I've got about 400 hours of research into this topic alone. Um, and we've done a lot of public facing presentations. That's where some of the news outlets were, were being quoted with is to understand gotcha. the difference. So, it, you know, to sort of speak to the heart of it, I, I always go back to the basics. You know, what, what's the supply and what's the demand? And if we ever want to get an idea of what's going to happen with housing in the future, it's like we have to look at four different things. We have to look at what is the underlying supply? Um, what is the current and future demand? Um, what is the nature of the credit environments that exist since, you know, about uh, 70, 70%, 73% of all buyers use credit to some degree, 27% are cash. Um, and then what is the affordability, which is a big one. And so if we're, if we're going to like just line those four things up side by side for today, back compared to the Great Recession, guess what? Today, we have a dramatic undersupply of homes, right? Under a million of inventory. In you go back to you know oh oh seven oh eight we had a we had a ridiculous oversupply of homes like you know upwards of four million I think if I remember correctly today if we look at so that's on the supply side if we look at the demand side on the demand there was little known fact but there was a dramatic fall off of new buyers coming into the marketplace based on the demographics if you look at if you look at the the uh, traditionalists. And then the baby boomers, and then the X generation, and then the millennials, um, and then you know Gen Z. The X generation, there was a rapid fall off of birth rates, and if you forward that birth rate into like when is that pool of buyers going to actually come to the marketplace, or or sort of that vacuum in the marketplace, you know what it was? 2006. So 2006, seven, eight, nine, and ten. The typical birth rate of people coming in the marketplace dropped off. Like, so almost like if you have a lemonade stand and you know there's 100 cars going by, and all of a sudden there's going to be only 50 cars going by for a while, you're going to sell less lemonade. So, like, the same thing happened in housing way lower demand with a glut of supply. Credit, we all know what happened. You know, there was, uh, you know, I don't know, upwards of a, a third of all the product was adjustable rate loans that move with the marketplace. Right. And, you know, if you compare credit to today, um, it's the cleanest paper that we've had, you know, in decades and there's more equity in homes. And I mean, we, we we've helped about 5000 families over the last five years with purchase or refinance. So we have, you know, data. Plus, we have lots of, you know, firsthand and anecdotal evidence. Um, and the only one that's the same and it's even a little bit worse now is affordability. And so a lot of people think because of two reasons because housing prices ran up pretty high. A lot of people say, I've seen this pattern before. It runs up high and then it crashes. It ran up high again, it must crash. Okay, but what they're not looking is the under the surface. Way less supply, way more demand. What is the same as affordability and what does that mean? Well, that means that people need to live somewhere and if they can't afford to buy a house, what do they do? Like they find roommates. And they live with their parents longer and then they figure out a rent or they move out of state or like, you know, whatever it is, water seeks lowest level. So 
from an affordability standpoint, it's a huge pain point. But you think about it, if you have 100 homes for sale, and in the past, you had 100 buyers, and now you have 150 buyers, but 30 of them can't afford it, you still have more buyers than homes. And so that that even with the unaffordability, so there's pent up demand of a lot of people that want to buy a home, they can't afford it. And so the households are getting kind of backlogged. Like I'll, I'll give you an example. When I graduated from college, I lived with, uh, I technically still live with my parents, right? Because I was, there was, I was part of their household. And then after graduating myself and four buddies rented a house. So we added one household. What if the next year, all of us markets, good rates are low enough. We can afford it. We all go buy homes. Now there's five households added, but if it's not affordable, you know what we're just going to do? We're going to live together longer, right? Until we have enough income comes up. And so that's what's happening. The, the factors to crash the market just do not exist unless there's some kind of a black swan event uh, or, um, or, you know, if, if rates ratchet up much higher and it's more because people get spooked. Um, but there's just, there's such an imbalance of supply and demand. We're short nationwide, somewhere in the range of like 4 million homes. Um, there's a, I mean, think about it. There's a million homes for a population for sale. Half of them are under contract and there's a population of 330 million. The support in housing is ridiculous. So that would be my answer on that. I know that's a long-winded answer, but uh, it's no. the basics of supply and demand for me. No, I love it. No, well said. You know, there's been a lot of experts who have gotten it wrong. And, you know, and I, I can't remember if it was if it was Barry Habib or if it was some other uh, folks or, or experts, quote unquote, that said that, you know, what, what was going to happen with the housing market with regards to interest rates? Now, I heard several times that interest rates by mid-May were going to be in the mid-fives, like they were going to come back down. And obviously that didn't happen. Uh, what have been some of your surprises that you've seen or, or what have you been surprised about in 2023 with regards to housing or mortgages? Yeah, I think I think that the uh, life tends to like equalize over time. And so and also um, something else I learned, I think this is my dad, it was markets can stay irrational longer than many oftentimes people can stay solvent. So plan for times of insolvency. And even if something like that's something that I'm intrigued by on the behavioral science side is is people stay irrational for longer than you expect. So if you look back to even through the great recession, look at, and you look at the massive amounts of money and Intel that was put into funding and financing loans that would just made no sense whatsoever, that irrationality took place. In fact, that's what the big short, you know, is one of my mm -hmm. favorite books is, was written about. Uh, Michael Lewis yeah. is things stayed irrational for a, like a year and a half, two years, like silly irrational. Okay. And so I, mm -hmm. I think that a lot of times people underestimate how long something, even when it should correct to the mean doesn't because of a whole series of forces. So, you know, whether, and I, I'm a huge fan of Barry, Barry, uh, Barry Habib. I've, I've followed him for years. Logan Montashami. Uh, Mike Simonson from Altos, John Malden. I've, I've been to all his conferences. And I just, when I look at these guys, here's the thing. They're right, but it's kind of like you know, sometimes the winds blow one direction or another for a while. And so it might take them a little longer to be right. So, yeah. you know, anytime we're trying to like, you know, it, it, same thing. It's like if you're, if you're, if you're at war and you have a plan and you're going to go to war on something, you're, there may be adjustments that it takes place to execute your plan. Um, so I do think Barry's right. Um, and, you know, I follow his predictions on inflation, um, on, you know, the spread between the 10 year and the 30 year, um, you know, the, the jobs report, you know, the Fed's action. There's just so many conflicting forces that are against it. 
Yeah. Maybe yeah. it takes an extra six months for it to play through, but uh, um, but yeah, I, I you, what we can never do is bank a business model on a particular point in time because I mean that was the point of like Michael Burry Scion Capital back with uh, through the Great Recession is he was right and he was spot on, but the markets were irrational for another year until he was proven right because eventually you know math always wins over time and sometimes emotions and psychology can prevent math from like working through the system so it'll work through the system it just might take you know an extra six to nine months yeah yeah i agree with that and and i and i'll put you on the spot one more time with regards to to more math so with that what do you think is in store for the second half of the year? Do you have an opinion on where mortgage rates will be? Yeah. So I'll tell you this, this is going to sound like a little bit sadistic, but the longer they <laughs> stay higher, the better for the overall health of the real estate market for mm. folks that are in the mortgage business like me as well. Yeah. We absolutely want rates to come down so that, um, you know, that we can have refinances and cash out refinances and we need that for our business. But the bigger issue is the one of housing. And right now, um, if rates were in the fives right now, we would see a significant run up in real estate values and it would and less inventory and it would exacerbate the issue. So I'm going to answer it two different directions for what I want to happen. Um, I for me, for, for me and my business, if we had a lot more refinance business, we'd all be a lot happier right now. Like just plain as day. It's tough out there. <laughs> but I'm going to answer this more from a longer term businessman than a shorter term businessman. And the longer term is the people that have staying power and actually bring value in this marketplace. There's a pretty significant washout of loan officers taking place in the business that don't bring value or don't have staying power. Like, or don't have mental or emotional or financial resilience to markets. And so if it stays longer for three months or six months, in my mind, that's actually going to be better for the folks that are remaining in the business that do have the, the staying power from a market share perspective. Um, it would be a lot easier right now, but it would actually be very challenging for the housing market. We need more inventory and we need that number to get closer to 1.5 to 2 million homes nationwide in order to get to a healthy housing market. So we have a lot of sales taking place um, and a slower trend of growth rate so that, you know, folks like my kids that are, you know, my oldest is early 20s. You know, if if rates, if values start to run out, off again, that's going to prolong the, the Gen Z from being able to buy for quite a while. So um, what do I think is going to happen? I think the price stay a little little higher than than just because that's the the human nature trend. I think they'll stay a little higher for longer, but I do think that's better for long term thinkers and for the housing market at large. I like it. I like it. I've been saying something similar to that in that you know a lot of people keep talking about you know they're not going to buy until they see the interest rates get to. You know, you name it. Everybody's got their number. Um, and nobody wants to give up on their on their interest rates, especially if they're a homeowner currently and they've got that three percent or whatever rate that they have. And you know, whether it's a first time homebuyer or one of the homeowners who are white knuckle gripping their three percent rate, and they're talking about, you know, I'm not going to do something until rates come down. And I just keep telling them that's be careful what you wish for as the rates come down, what is going to happen to property values, you know? And so to your point, uh, it, it, it's not the worst thing that could happen for interest rates to stay a little bit elevated and kind of wait for this leveling effect to take place. Yeah. For the, my personal opinion is the people that can't afford to buy now absolutely should hands down unequivocally yeah. categorically. They should. Why? Because, I mean, first of all, they're buying for a home, not as a speculator. You know, there's right. a very big difference between somebody that's buying as an owner occupied individual for their family versus buying as an investor. So anything I'm looking at now, I'm buying as an investor. But I know, like, I'll just share this. When I bought the house that we're, that we're still in today, I, 
I was looking for, I'm not buying a rate, I'm buying a home that is going to be my environment for a decade plus. So my advice is when you find that, and if you can afford it, like you never, you never, you know, overstep what's, what's financially possible. But if you can't afford it now and you find the home that is ideal for, for the healthy environment, you buy it. You can always restructure the debt later. The people that right. wait, I think it's flawed logic because it's kind of like waiting. What is it like a uh, black Friday? It's like, why would you want to go run out to the suit, you know, to when everyone else is there, it's just, it's chaos. And you end up, you know, paying higher, you end up settling for a house that you don't want. I think the priorities are wrong. Find the home that's the healthiest environment that you can afford because your alternative is renting. And then over time, I mean, here's the, here's the simple math. Fast forward, if you want to know what real estate's going to do in the future, in an aggressive market, it's going to double in 10 years values. In a normal mm -hmm. market, it's going to double in 15 years. And in a slow market, it's going to double in 20 years. Sort of like basic, you know, inflation, right? So right. if somebody's thinking, thinking out, whatever home you're in, it's going to be somewhere from 10 to 20 years that it's going to double probably about 15. That's a trend rate over the last hundred years. So that would be my advice is it would be flawed thinking to wait till rate, rates come down to buy unless you have to because of affordability. Right, right. No, that's, that's good advice. So I think that's a good segue. Uh, speaking of investment opportunities, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about Opportunity Zones? Yeah, abs yeah, absolutely. So uh, um, I have, uh, I I've been investing for a long time. And um, one of the things that, that uh, I set up, let's see, I guess it was about um, four years ago was an opportunity zone fund. And I'll kind of walk through the basics of this, but an opportunity zone, an, an opportunity zone is part of the 2017 tax act tax and jobs act that allows uh investors to take capital gains could be from the sale of real estate could be a busted 1031 exchange could be the sale of securities and invest that into an opportunity zone fund and the most amazing um tax advantages that that in a in a century and the short version is that all of the growth that takes place on that fund, as long as it stays in, a, in an, a, an opportunity zone fund for a 10 year window, will be able to exit tax free like a Roth IRA, like mind blowing. OK, mm. so um, so that's an opportunity zone fund. And I did this really to solve my own pain a number of years ago because I've done a lot of different real estate projects. And if there's an ideal 1031 exchange opportunity, great, do that. But if there's not, the last thing you want to do is pay capital gains tax on that when you could defer it, you can defer it till 2027 and then have all of the growth grow and exit tax free. So uh, it's kind of a complicated animal, but all of the ultra elite do this, like the family offices and, you know, all the uber wealthy, this is a part of their financial strategy to mitigate tax just kind of never made its way down to main street. I stumbled upon it by accident, long story. And so that's something that I've been doing now for a number of years in order to grow my own wealth with a much better tax strategy. And then also for investors that are in a similar situation. I like it. I like it. So I was going to ask you what you do in your uh, in your spare time, Mike, but um, I see that Ironman, marathons, triathlons. <laughs> so when you're not doing mortgages and real estate and Ironman, marathon and triathlons, what are you doing? Uh, we have a place in Big Bear Lake, so I like to go up to Big Bear and go uh, mountain biking with my boys or out on the lake or, you know, barbecue, whatever. Um, I like to read like to, you know, play chess with my boys, like just fun. I go work out with my daughter. My daughter's a, a freshman, going to be a sophomore at University of Oregon. She's home for the summer. So yeah, adventures with my kids, um, adventures outside, 
you know, it's, it sounds like there's a lot, there is a lot going on, but it's like, it's usually kind of very targeted. So the Ironman was a bucket yeah. list, um, that took about a, you know, six months to go and do all the training and do that. Um, I'll be climbing Mount Whitney. I like every quarter I'll look for a different adventure to do. And that's kind of how, like, usually it's going to involve being outside and I'll try to s- stack things where I can do things with friends of mine, especially maybe they're even in, you know, similar, similar industry. So we can, compare notes but i find that like life can be super fulfilling when it's intentional and exciting and with good healthy people and so pretty much all my adventures i'll try to like line all those things together i love it you mentioned a couple of books if not more than a couple just since we've been talking but give me one of your favorite books like what's a must read sure you know um i've got uh I'm going to grab one right now. This, this one right here uh, that I've just, I'm going through a couple. This is my third time through it. This is the, uh, if you can see it, the Almanac of Naval Ravikant. Phenomenal yeah. book. Phenomenal. This is a guy. So I'll, I'll share this with you, Craig. This is a guy that, that came from India, super poor and had to self-made, had to figure everything out, out on his own. And it's really interesting because he ended up building significant wealth, but he realized that there was, very little happiness and wealth. And so his whole story is a combination of, they, he calls it like a guide to both wealth and fulfillment. And so he talks about his journey in building wealth, but then also creating meaning and happiness and fulfillment in life and doing both. And he said, I had to work hard to build wealth, but I had to work harder to find and build happiness. And so it's pretty interesting because all of us, I think we're all, you know, sort of American dream we're seeking one to build wealth and financial independence and freedom. And like my thought is that, you know, more money will only make you more of what you already are. So if you don't have right. like internal peace and happiness, um, then it's going to amplify. Money's not going to bring it. It's going to amplify that dysfunction, right? It's going right. to actually make it worse. And so I thought that was interesting because, uh, cause he hit that head on and a lot of things that I'd be, I'd be thinking, he, he had, you know, articulated very clearly in his book. And so I'd, I'd recommend that one as well. I like it. I like it. So as we wrap things up, is there, is there a key takeaway or two that you could say for you know, the buyers and sellers that understandably so are, are fearful about this market and what to do? Like what's, and it's, I know it's a kind of difficult to like just sum up in a, in a word or a, even a sentence or a phrase, but you know, what are some things that you would say to those that are concerned about, okay, should I buy? Should I sell? Should I wait? Do you have any advice for those folks? Yeah, you know, we actually do webinars specifically on, on that. And it's, it's the most recent one is uh realist recession and real estate. What you need to know buy sell or hold and um nice. that's the that's the title that's the title nice. um, yep and uh, i can i can share the link if someone wants to register at the end but the my my advice is it depends on whether it's for your family and your your personal living situation or as an investor and those are different strategies yeah. so for me i do a lot of fix and flip projects um and of course we have the investment fund where we're building out um we're building out a hundred different uh, early stages, but townhomes that are going to be built to mm-hmm. rent for a while. When I look at the winds of demographic and the current, you know, supply and demand imbalance, um, there's just a lot of upside in real estate coming over the next decade, a lot. So for the I mean, the, the tough part is that the media scares people a lot. And there's just so much, it's so easy to find stuff that'll scare you. But on every single project I've done, I've had some element of fear beforehand. It's human nature. So I think my advice would be don't let unwarranted fears keep you from building a life. um, And that is going to be, that will best serve you over time. The fear will, uh, the fear never goes away. And a little bit of fear is healthy, but fear can i think prevent and steal dreams from people so when it comes to real estate again if somebody has the capacity to financially 
what I wouldn't think they should be worried about, and they have, you know, kind of three to five years or longer, I think it would be a very smart financial move to buy um, rather than to wait. Well said. Very well said, Mike. So a special thanks to The Mortgage Reports for making this episode possible. I want to thank all of our listeners and wherever you watch or listen or a combination of the two uh, to your podcast, if you could please rate and review it, that helps promote the, the channel, that helps promote the podcast and um, get our message out to more people. And if there's somebody that you think that can benefit from today's show, uh, be a good friend and share it with that person. So Mike, if our listeners want to connect with you and get more information, including that link that you were just talking about, uh, what's the best way for them to do so? Yep, absolutely. Um, Mike.hardy at churchillmortgage.com is the, uh, the best email. Um, and I have a website which kind of has sort of my, my different uh, projects and even some of the things I talked about today. Um, and it's uh, MikeHardyBio.com, um, MikeHardyBio, Bio.com. Uh, on there is also a link where upcoming webinars, you can register for that as well. So any of the listeners that want to talk real estate, um, mortgage market, we actually have a program for uh, loan officers that want to retire, like a retirement program strategy for loan officers. That's something that's nice. super innovative that no one else does. Um, happy to chat. I love this business, mortgage business, real estate investing. So anything in that world and that I can serve in any way, I'd be happy to. Fantastic. MikeHardyBio.com, right? Perfect. That's awesome, man. Hey, Mike, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. It's been really enjoyable. You've had some incredible insight. I know your time is, is, is important and it's valuable. And we appreciate you today. Craig, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and uh, it's been great to get to know you as well. So I appreciate it. Absolutely. Good luck with you and your future endeavors, Mike. Thank you. Appreciate it.